Hi, good afternoon, Paul, or good morning for you, I guess. Yeah, morning, it's 9 a.m. here. Good, and it's six o'clock here in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, in the evening. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. It's my pleasure. Great. So yeah, I reached out to you. Um, I'm uh, organizing something called the European Men's Gathering over here. Uh, it's going to be in Denmark this year. Um, we've been going for about three and a half years now. Uh, last year, we had about 140 men that showed up at this event, uh, where really it's uh, something that's, I think, Jordan Peterson has been a big inspiration for us. Um, and we're really exploring this kind of idea of bringing men together. And we really started with the idea of what does it mean to be a man in society today? Um, and, and very quickly we added on to that, you know, how are we as men taking responsibility for, for ourselves? Uh, and, and it's not so like we kind of contrast it with the idea of a men's rights organization that's talking about rights. And we're really talking about like, well, how do we as men kind of actually take responsibility and, and work on ourselves, um, not as a, in opposition to women, but, but together with women. And I, I think the kind of tidy up your room approach has been um, really good. Last year, our, our theme for our gathering was uh, rites of passage. Uh, so it was really much this idea of how do we create events which can help people to take a step from one phase of life to the next phase of life. And, and, and we, there's a lot of, we spoke a lot about like kind of boy psychology versus man psychology. Uh, sometimes in society, I think one of the reasons why Jordan Peterson is so popular is because we see a lot of people that aren't really getting these basic tools of how to organize their life, get a job, take care of their own finances, create a supportive, loving relationship with another person uh, and a good family and stuff like that. Um, and, and so that's been really, really powerful. Uh, we had that in Sweden last year. And then this year is, uh, we, we decided, we had a good brainstorm about what topics to take. And uh, we decided on, we're calling it modern male archetypes. Uh, so this idea from, you know, I guess it comes from Carl Jung and far before him, Joseph Campbell, um, about what are the archetypes that have been relevant for men? You know, we have this classical king, warrior, magician, lover, um, but then also how do we play that into a modern context and, uh, and, and how can we, is that a tool that we can use to help men to understand their identity, what they're supposed to do, how to find purpose and, you know, especially in our kind of postmodern fragmented society. Uh, and so then um, I've been really looking a lot into especially Orthodox Christianity recently uh, and have been following your videos for quite a long time, really enjoyed some of your diving into C.S. Lewis, Jordan Peterson and a whole lot of other uh, things, basically, but you bring in kind of a biblical perspective uh, and, and, and really the core of it for me and what I was thinking of is, is Jesus Christ uh, as actually perhaps the fundamental archetype, uh, the, the metahero of Western society, the, 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 the God made man or something like that. Right. And, and so I took contact to you and uh, asked you, is that something that sounds interesting? And, and you said, well, let's give it a shot and try it out. So, so here we are today and we're going to take a little bit of time to explore that. So yeah, Terrific. thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. This is fun. Yeah. Great. So, um, I don't know, what's, what's the first thing that pops into your mind when you, when you think of this idea of archetype and Jesus uh, and, and how does that work? And maybe you could even start with giving a bit of background of how you kind of brought your work as a pastor into this whole Jordan Peterson world. Okay. I started, I found Jordan Peterson in early 2017. Bill C-16 was about October, November of 2016. I had first heard of Jordan Peterson through Rod Dreer's website. Rod Dreer is a, um, a blogger in the United States. He converted to orthodoxy, actually. And I was a little surprised that a Canadian psychologist would be making a fuss over non-binary pronouns, because in my experience in California, that everyone sort of has been going along with things. And so then when Jordan Peterson was making a fuss about it, I thought, well, that's strange. And then I, I began to listen to some of his other videos and thought that was interesting. And then when he was doing a biblical series, that really got my attention. And I began to notice on Reddit and in comment sections that people were expressing an interest in Christianity after listening a lot to Jordan Peterson. And I thought that was unusual. So I 
pretty much figured I wanted to know what was making this man tick. And so then one of the things that I did, I'd been blogging, I'd been looking for people to talk to jo talk about Jordan Peterson with, and I couldn't find a lot just around me because most people, if you say, hey, there's a guy that I'm interested in and you have to sit down and listen to about 20, 30 hours of video content before you can have a conversation with me, that doesn't go anywhere. So I, I was blogging about him. I was on email listservs talking about him, but again, couldn't find a lot of conversation partners. I was also reading Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, and I thought there's something about YouTube and Jordan Peterson. There's an intersectionality, if you will, about those two things. And so I decided I'd been playing around with YouTube just with a member of my congregation and some other things. And so I decided to make a YouTube video about just the, the three, three reasons a pastor thinks Jordan Peterson is important. And whereas I'd had 15 subscribers on my YouTube channel that had posted sermons and the Freddie and Paul show with a guy from the church, suddenly the next day I had 300. And a few days later, I had a thousand and it kept growing. And I started getting emails from people and phone calls from people and requests for conversation. And I thought, well, this is a strange thing. And many of the conversations were, most of the conversations were from men. And they, they were, there was a renewed interest or curiosity about the Bible and Christianity. Many of the people that I had spoken with had had a little bit of nominal interaction with Christianity in their youth and abandoned it. They thought it was it wasn't it wasn't coherent or it couldn't be squared with a a scientific worldview and But there was a lot of interest in exploring it, and so the channel just continued to grow i I made some commentary videos on Jordan Peterson's biblical series. I should probably make some more. And the, the conversation just kept growing. And then I had people wanting to talk with me and I began having repeat conversations with people. So I started asking people if they would be willing to have me record our conversation. And then after they had a chance to review it, if they would allow me to post the conversation, and that got going. So then what I very much wanted is to have people talking with other people instead of just having it all go through me. And that's been developing. So I've been doing this for about a year and a half and it continues to grow and I continue to try to figure out how to handle this as it scales up while keeping my day job as a pastor of a real life church. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the questions do revolve around Jesus and manhood in some ways. I remember when I was a college student, a friend of mine had a boyfriend. This was a Christian college, Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, and the girl was telling me how her boyfriend didn't believe in Jesus and didn't, wasn't, didn't find Jesus uh, attractive or engaging because she, he thought Jesus was weak. And I discovered, and I've, I've seen often that that's a common thought about Jesus, because Jesus is often associated in a sort of low-resolution way with tolerance, uh, turn the other cheek, some of these kinds of ideas, whereas growing up, I had never in my life associated Jesus with weakness. Part of the reason being that Many of the stories about Jesus do come from the Gospels that are found in the Bible, but there are a lot of other images of Jesus in the New Testament, specifically the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where Jesus is this cosmic figure that holds destiny in his hands. There are other, and there are also... And he comes riding on a horse with a sword coming out of his exactly. mouth. Exactly. I mean, this is, he this is, is the not, judge he, of... Uh... <laughs> and, and also... One of the things that you begin to notice about the Bible, as Jordan Peterson said, the Bible is very much hyperlinked. And many of the Old Testament heroes are types of Jesus early on. And they're always imperfect types. They're always flawed types. But you have characters like, like David, who is a very masculine guy. So this 
I don't know. Isn't this if... like an idea from from Jordan Peterson about the idea of the hero as an abstraction of positive behavior or something like that, right? Where human beings have kind of abstracted it out, and then as society develops, then we get higher and higher abstractions. And and really, the this is something that for me was a massive insight watching Jordan Peterson is understanding the idea of God, not as you know a man with a beard up in the sky who who you know was after having studied science was something that just didn't make sense to me at all it seemed like some kind of childish understanding but like for example as as a the highest point on a pyramid of value of what is the good what is you know what are the valuable things in life or how do i what's an abstraction of positive behavior that's loving or building up or something like that um and and so seeing the bible in that light kind of thing as you're saying like it's many different types um and and there seems to be a reference between many of these different historical characters through the bible from adam all the way to jesus christ right and, and and the whole image of god as an old man in the sky has huge problems when it comes to the bible given the fact that right there in the ten commandments the the commandment is not to represent god in terms of um exclusively represent god in an image form in terms of something that is part of his creation now when jesus talks about god as father that creates a mental image but old man in the sky is not really a Christian image, even though Christians have used it. You go to the Sistine Chapel, one of the most famous images from, by Michelangelo. To me, especially in my tradition, we don't represent God as part of, as an element from his creation. It would be like representing a baker by a statue of a cake. But any baker would likely be offended I am not, I make cakes. I myself am not a cake. I am a cake maker. And so the question of representation, of representation is important. Archetypes, I, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking like, perhaps this is also part of the reason why it seems like large parts of Western society. I live in Denmark where I think a growing number of people, you know, they can call themselves cultural Christians, yeah. but the idea of God is, is often kind of seen as very childish. And, and maybe a large part of that is because um, a lot of us have a very childish understanding of what Christianity is. And in some ways, Jordan Peterson is, is bringing a far more nuanced kind of, he, 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 I normally say he kind of builds a bridge between the, the, the material understanding of the world and, and the more spiritual or abstract intellectual understanding uh, and brings together this mythologies and religions and, and then science really somehow. And it seems to me that uh, what a lot of people reject when they reject Christianity is this kind of childish, you know, daddy in the sky kind of thing that, which is taught really in Sunday schools, I guess. Um, uh, but never really. It, sometimes. Before. Yes. Poorly. <laughs> the church, the church is responsible for a lot of its own bad PR and the church is responsible for a lot of the missteps that Christianity has suffered over the last hundred years. And, and I don't think churches should duck that. Instead of being defensive, I think we should own up to the ways that we have failed the story. You know, the, the idea of archetype is an interesting one. And you mentioned yourself that you have this, you, you see enough heroes. And so you have this sort of imaginative template or model as a hero. Just recently, Jordan Peterson did a conversation with, with Bishop Bear and that, I don't know if it's out in video form yet. It's currently out in audio form on Jordan Peterson's podcast stream mm -hmm. but he he makes a point in that conversation that he makes in a number of other places that once a student asked if if we could if if someone could write the the perfect archetypal story let's say the perfect story of the hero and have that story be once and for all and and peterson makes a makes a very important point with that that i'm going to adjust a little bit because i I think the reason we have to keep telling archetypal stories, stories that use archetypes within them and express the archetype, is that in, in every specific cultural context, the, the locality, the culture, the geography, the specifics, the, this gets into Aristotelian philosophy, which is a little far afield right now, but, but you take the archetype and it becomes flesh, okay? That's very much a 
a, an idea from the New Testament. Jesus, Jesus is the Logos becoming flesh. And, and the thing is, when you become flesh in a specific time and space, in a geography and a culture, you have to take the archetype and embody it with specifics that are local. Now, when it comes to Jesus, that's highly important because Jesus very much functions as an archetype, but he, the stories from the, the Gospels are set in the first century in a specific place and time. Yet, this is what, this is what you begin to see like in the beginning of the first, the, the first chapter of the book of Revelation, where it's this cosmic figure that each of us are supposed to embody him, but within our own within our own times. The difficulty, I just had a conversation yesterday about this, in fact. The difficulty we have with Jesus is, is not so much balance, but because as a an American theologian, a colonial American theologian, Jonathan Edwards, made the point, Jesus embodies what he called diverse excellencies, which means that we are used to people having to balance, let's say, strength and kindness. Jesus so often is more strong than we think he should be and more kind than we think he should be. We usually try to integrate both of those ideas by balance. I'll be less strong and I'll be less kind in order to balance the ideas. But what makes Jesus so compelling is he actually raises the volume on both strength and kindness. Because if you want to see strong, you know, well, still a storm. If you see a hurricane coming in, that's what we call them in the United States, cyclones throughout the world, you see a cyclone coming in and just laying waste to hundreds of miles of civilization, well, Jesus is shown as being strong enough to say to a, so a storm, stop, and it stops. Now, the question is, if you have the kind of power that can stop a storm, don't you also have the kind of power that could create a storm? And if you have the kind of power that can raise a person from the dead, which we can't do, don't you also have the kind of power to kill a person, which we can do? And so these stories of Jesus lead us into a figure that we admire and wish to emulate, but continually fall short. And, and I would encourage people that are curious about Jesus to just read the Gospels and, and, and stop for a moment and consider the kind of man that would say something like at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. You know, people say to me, well, I can't believe in the virgin birth. I say, okay, well, how about a man who says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? That's an, out, that's an outrageous statement but he makes it. And so I actually have a lot of, I don't have, I don't get offended when people read that stuff and say, well, I just can't believe it. I actually have more of a problem with cultural Christians that read it and say, oh yeah, that's just the way it is. I, it's like, you're not taking it seriously. Yeah. I, the quote that really, I, that hits me sometimes is this one where he says, I think there were some people that were accusing him of like uh, yeah, having a devil or something like that. And then he speaks about Abraham and, and then, and then at, at some point he says, before Abraham was, I am, uh, yes. which is basically something that God has said before, right? Which is perhaps this, you know, it's, it's a full complete identification with, uh, with the divine of, of being that representative in, in that moment. So yeah, Jesus was, wasn't, you know, some people say Jesus was a good moral teacher or something like that <laughs> it's like no he wasn't just a, either he was completely crazy or he was what he said he was somehow right or or something like well, that. well that's that's c.s lewis's famous trilemma and and one of the few things that jordan peterson has actually commented directly on c.s lewis was the trilemma and 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 peterson made a very interesting quip where he said i, I really just can't get around that trilemma that how could a man 
that all over the world, people will say things like, well, he was a good man. He was a great moral teacher. But when you actually read the kinds of things that he said, you, anybody who's paying attention should stop and say, no, wait a minute. And, and, and even this idea of a man being God, I think part of the reason part of the reason we reduce that and diminish that is because, and this gets into what I think part of the contribution that Jordan Peterson has made, is I think in the West for the last couple of hundred years, we have taken the idea of God and reduced God into an old man in the sky. Reduced God very much. See, one of the things that I, I saw very quickly with Jordan Peterson when he was, when he was debating Sam Harris was Jordan Peterson would talk about what he thought God was and Sam Harris in that first Vancouver, Vancouver talk about three quarters of the way through said, no, no, that's not God. Because Jordan Peterson had an idea of God that in fact was, was cosmic, that God selects, God acts. And, and this is exactly what we get hung up on. But now when a man comes and says that he is God, what do you mean by that, especially if you have an ancient idea of God? If you read, for example, Plato, one of the things that I noticed when I read Plato is sometimes Plato talks about the gods, and sometimes Plato talks about God. Well, well we know that they're polytheists. Why singular? Because this, I, this conception of God, which is sort of pantheistic, of the God that makes decisions every day of, you know, even when a storm comes through your town, insurance companies will call that an act of God. This, this God that, you know, in the words of a friend of mine, kills grandmas and puppies every day. You know, that when we hear that, we, 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 we don't know what to do with it. So then a man comes and says, I'm God, and he attempts, he attempts to embody that as a human being. Again, if anybody sits down and gives this any serious thought, a myriad of problems will arise. And, and what we should really be amazed by is that this idea caught on at all. Not, you know, <laughs> and even, even then becomes the, the largest religion in the history of the world. I mean, these ideas are are, are mind-blowing, but we, yeah. we don't have any appreciation for their magnitude. Well, I want to go back to one of the things you were talking about earlier, about this balance, I think you said, between strength and... What and it, kindness, uh, let's and say. And kindness, yeah, the, those two things, because I really think that's mirrored very much in the debate around the work that I'm doing today with men's work, because part, you know, you have a, a party of people who are saying, like, okay, for men to be okay, you know, we've had Me Too, we've had, like, all of this, you know, like, kind of talk about the patriarchy and the oppressiveness of men. So men need to become much more kind. Men need to become much more soft and more sensitive. A lot like men need to become more like women, right? And, and to a certain extent, there's a truth in that because men have been very oppressive and tyrannical and, you know, destructive and cause environmental destruction and press people down, right? And, and then, at the, but at the same time, you also have people who are talking about, well, no, that's absolutely incorrect. Men need to become more like men. You know, we need to have courage and honor and stoicism and directness and power. Uh, and, and, and so men need to be, you know, like we need to have much more uh, strength. Uh, exactly. And, and, and I think the, in the book of, in the, in the gospel of John, then the words that John uses to uh, kind of sum up Jesus, he says, full of grace and truth. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I, I saw, I saw a quote, which said that Jesus didn't come to bring a balance between grace and truth, but to uh, attain a full portion of both that's somehow. Right. And, and that's kind of like a mystery. It's like, well, how do you do that? that? It doesn't really make sense. And in any concrete situation, I notice when I'm in a conflict or when I'm standing in front of uh, my, you know, uh, 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 um, someone who's emotional or having difficulty agreeing with me about something like that, then I, I always feel torn between, okay, you know, do I go the soft route and, and try to understand and be kind and, and merciful or, or do I put down my foot and say, no, I disagree. And, and, and that's where that, so, so it's like, the, and, and very often, you know, these discussions between there's, there's no real easy solution, except perhaps uh, 
and, and that's what I would say is in this archetype of, of Jesus Christ uh, is, is, is that's, that's the solution, if, if you can say that. Well, and, and part of the difficulty of embodying an archetype that gets these, again, these ideas of diverse excellencies, strength and kindness, let's say, is, is, the, question is, is the question of time and the moment. Because there are moments to be strong mm -hmm. and there are moments to be so kind. I, I don't want to use soft because that puts it then in, in contrast. Mm -hmm. For example, Jesus, again, if, you, if someone reads the Gospels, Jesus is going to continue to surprise them because Jesus will sometimes treat people in ways that other people think is just horrendously wrong. You know, that the two, a guy comes to Jesus and says, tell my brother to divide the inheritance. Well, that sounds like so the, the, the assumed backstory is that their father died and you have two brothers and the, probably the older brother is holding on to the estate and won't divide it with his brother or with the siblings. And you would expect Jesus to say, oh, yeah, you should, you should do what's right and divide the inheritance. And instead, Jesus lays into the man about the love of money. And it's like, wow. And, and there's this scene in the Gospel of John where there's a woman at a well, and she's there not at the time all the other women are at the well. And Jesus, they're traveling through Samaria, and there's some cultural and religious conflicts between Jesus' group of people and the Samaritans, and Jesus strikes up a conversation with this woman. And, and e even in this same conversation, at some times you would expect Jesus to pounce on aspects of her life, and he's extremely gentle. And then at the same moment, he says something that you think, how dare he say that? And, and, and this, so often for us, this breaking of the script in, in ways that we don't expect are exactly how he expresses, well, see, and this is, I think, the difficulty we have with Jesus is when we talk about Jesus and we say, well, there's an archetype that Jesus fulfills, actually, Jesus himself is the archetype. And that, that's really hard to get our mind around, because you're exactly right. We tend to see all of these heroes and we extract a, a mental archetype from them. And what Jesus keeps doing is being the archetype himself. And again... And he's kind of like the archetype who, who, as you said, like I like we said, breaks the script kind of thing, right? Like has the reaction. Most other archetypes, if you think of like Achilles or something like that, then you can make a list of the qualities that they have that, you know, are fairly like, you know, he has this and this and this. Uh, and whereas Jesus seems to somehow defy description somehow, loving perhaps you could call him, but you know, as you said, some of the actions that he takes isn't the kind of very soft and you know, caring, uh, yeah, loving. I don't know, that, that seems, I agree with you. Like uh, the, this idea, if I, I tried Googling Jesus, right? And looking for pictures and the, the pictures that you see are very soft, very feminine, very kind of, um, you know, uh, yeah. And, 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 and it seems like that's a, something that Western Christianity seems to have developed somehow. No, I think, when, so when you talk about archetypes, I think that one of the important things to realize is that the primary mode of speech that we have in this area is not descriptive, such as strong and kind, but they are in fact stories. Because a story has the capacity to relate so much more truth than just kind of a flat explanation or description. And, and especially that's especially true when it comes to Jesus, because in the, in the four Gospels in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, it's, it's all done by story. For example, with Pilate. So Jesus is arrested. Well, in the Gospel of John, the temple guard comes to take Jesus, and he basically says to them, you know, I am he, and in the Gospel of John, the temple guard falls to the ground. I mean, it's like something, something you'd see in a super, superhero movie. That, that, and, and, and it isn't a supernatural thing like Jesus, you know, some force came out and knocked them down. It was, in fact, 
his manner of presence and being that was so that was so unexpected from this group of soldiers that came to arrest him that they just stood back and and so then at that point you'd think okay so he's not going to allow himself to be taken which would be very reasonable and then you know he shows them his power and basically says all right I'll come with you. And then his, you know, Peter comes and Peter's got a sword. Jesus told him to take a sword. And Peter, not a very good guy with a sword, cuts off the ear ear of the, the servant of the high priest. And Jesus stops them and basically said, if anybody's blood is going to be shed, it's going to be mine. And it's like, he doesn't say that, but that's essentially what happens. And then he heals the guy. And it's like, well, what's going on here? And then he goes through this whole kangaroo court and he goes to Pilate. And and Pilate is just a corrupt middle politician, and these charges are trumped up, and even the corrupt politician knows it, and so Pilate's in the conversation thinking, I'm not looking to do the Jews a favor, I'm not looking to cause myself a political mess, you know, all Jesus really has to do is give me any excuse to let him go, and, you know, even I, who is a corrupt middle politician will let this guy go and jesus doesn't answer him for the longest time and Pilate gets frustrated don't you understand that i have this power and jesus says i could call down legions of angels and you stop and think who says things like this <laughs> and and then and then jesus says to Pilate, oh you you know the only authority you have has been given to you by god and who no, talks? by my father right <laughs> yeah by my father who talks like this and then Jesus goes and is crucified. And when he's on the cross, he's being mocked by saying, you know, you saved others, you can't save yourself. And again, this is a guy who raised the dead. I mean, even if you don't believe in the miracles, just in the frame of the story, okay? So I'd say to someone, well, I can't believe all that miraculous stuff. Okay, well, just, just read it like you're watching a Harry Potter movie or a, or a Marvel Universe. And just read the story itself and ask yourself, how does he work in the story? And, and what you begin to see is the immense power it took not to foil a Roman crucifixion, but to go through with it. And, and so this image, you know, if you look at, say, literature in the West ever since Jesus, you find Jesus' figures all over the place. Bishop Barron talked about the movie Gran Torino, which is a phenomenal movie where, where you know, the old man, Clint Eastwood, embodies this, you know, he's this grumpy old man. He's, he's annoyed by all the Hmong. He hates his children more because they're useless, you know, useless people. And the, the people that he hates, he embraces in the Hmong. And right there in Gran Torino, he gives his life for, for this young Hmong family. And of course, he dies and his arms are spread. Movie after movie after movie, take these ideas of Christ and put them into Clint Eastwood and, and put them into men and women, how they sacrifice themselves. This has been the dominant artistic motif of the West. We keep taking it and putting it in. Well, it all comes from the Jesus story. Mm -hmm. I even saw Wonder Woman was like crucified in lights <laughs> as the savior of That's mankind, right? right? That's so, right. That's right. Uh, and so it's it's so recurrent and and um, through understanding the base story where it all comes from, that that's what gives one uh, a better overview of of how this is being played out in all the other stories as well, right? So I think that's uh, kind of can can give a higher and, and, and idea even. Um, Harris, I forget his first name. The you know one of the one of the celebrity atheists from England, um, who Sam Harris. Sam Harris. No, not not Sam Harris. Not Sam Harris. Uh, Dawkins. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Richard yeah. Dawkins. That's what I'm thinking of. You know, even Dawkins, and and many atheists will say, if one one of the real lapses in the development in the the the, the maintenance of Western civilization lately has been biblical illiteracy. Because you really can't understand, you can't understand anything that's been written for the last thousand years in the West if you don't understand the basic vocabulary of the Bible and these stories. And, and one of the things that I've seen in people who have come to me and 
you know, many of whom are still atheist or agnostic, but they're curious about this and exploring this. I always say, well, just, just read the Gospels because, or, or read the story parts of the Old Testament and go ahead and be offended because another guy that I'm sort of following, John Verveke, what part of what the Bible does is we read something and we say, no, that can't be right. Jesus, for example, Jesus is traveling outside of the area where the Jews are concentrated, and he meets a woman, and, mm-hmm. and this woman basically asks for something. And Jesus says to her, you know, why should I, you know, why should I throw to the dogs what's meant for the children? And, and you read that, and you just think, He's basically calling her a dog, right? Because That's right. Because she's Samaritan or something. That's right. And then yeah. she comes back at him. And then yeah. he gives her what she asks for. I mean, this yeah. whole story is, is yeah. meant to just pull us out of the facile, cheap moralities that we construct, usually from bad movies. And, and I think it's actually these kinds of shocking things that develop in us the moral imagination to become stronger than society thinks we ought to be and kinder than society thinks is, is reasonable. And, and that's exactly how an archetype is supposed to function within us, that we will be surprisingly strong and irresponsibly kind <laughs> at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, strengths and weakness is a phrase that keeps popping up for me that seems uh, interesting um, or relevant. I was wondering, Paul, do you, do you want to try just for, if you had to try and summarize, now you're a pastor, um, for those that haven't read, if you had to like kind of describe the arc of the story of Jesus and like what are the main characteristics that are relevant for human beings today through that story, what would, how would you describe that? Uh, you know, in, in two or three minutes or something like that. Do you want to give that a shot? Sure. Uh, it, it's important that he was born a nobody in nowhere. Mm-hmm. Now, there's all of this. Again, it's, it's very archetypal right from the start because uh, Mary and Joseph, you know, descendant from the line of David. So right away they connect him to David, but he has to flee into Egypt like Israel. So one of the things, one of the elements about Jesus is Jesus re-embodies the Israel story. So often I say, start reading about Jesus and then go to the Old Testament because Jesus re-embodies the Israel story. And what Jesus basically does, how he functions in the Bible, is he gets Israel right. That's a big part of the story. So Jesus spends his first 30 years, there's one little story about Jesus when he's about 12, but he spends his first 30 years in obscurity, basically as a good guy in a small town who is actually living in an area of the Roman Empire that is a real cosmopolitan place. And so Jesus, as he's often called a carpenter, he was probably also, he was probably more of a builder. He's not making little things. He's probably working construction. So Jesus is a, you know, again, he's a small town guy who works construction for mm-hmm. the first 30 years of his life. There were elements of, of mystery about him that, that are, you know, that are mysterious and then, and he's, he's well-knit familiarly into this town in the region. Now, there are, there are Jewish villages. It's almost like I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, and there are all these little ghettos, in fact. So you had the, you know, the, the different parts of town where different people are living. So he's in a, he's in a Jewish village, but there are, there are Gentile villages around, and so there's a lot of construction going up in the area. And then Jesus starts to do things that, make everyone stop and say, as he had a psychic breakdown. In fact, he does the kinds of things that prompts his own family at one point to say, you know, we need to, we need to grab a hold of him and keep him at home because he's, he's saying things like that are leading everyone to believe that he's, he's claiming to be God. You know, and, and again, if one of us claims to be God, it's like, yeah, you want to find people claiming to be God? <laughs> there, are, there are places we keep such folks, and they are 100% sincere. Yeah. But I've had a lot of chance to know people with mental illness, 
the kind of crazy that Jesus was is not the kind of crazy that I see all the time. And, and so he, he starts doing, and I, Jonathan Peugeot does a real nice job with a lot of this symbolism. He starts, he starts doing things that are very much in keeping with the story of Israel, but he, he's, he's, He's in Galilee, and a sense you have to understand the culture. And I can't go into that whole thing. I do that more in my sermons, especially in some stuff I did in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. But Jesus, in a sense, says, "I'm going to heal everyone in this town. Bring them all to me. People with unclean spirits." And again, that's culturally located. And and you have these stories of just mobs of people coming around and lepers and blind people and and people who had mental illness and people who had demons and and jesus is just healing them all and so we have to keep the connection just to i'm just thinking so you know if we're talking about the relevance as this is an archetype yep. for people to be embodying today then how would you would that be because like jesus is not differentiating towards showing love towards a wide range of people or or what do you think is the... Yes, he is, he is, well, and this is the crazy thing about Jesus. Everyone would imagine to climb a status hierarchy, but he does, he heals someone and says, don't tell anybody about it. And of course, nobody can keep that stuff a secret. And, and this then gets embodied in, in the Christian tradition of, if you help somebody, don't let anybody else know about it. If you give money, figure out a way to do it secretly. Because yeah, so Jesus is going around and helping people that's right. by actively not seeking the glory for it, not seeking his own fame, not, not um, actually saying to people like, you know, if you go and pray, then do it in secret that's instead right. of doing it in public. That's right. Um, and you can where, find this, you can find this in, you know, other Clint Eastwood movies. Clint Eastwood loves to embody the, the Jesus archetype in some ways, even though often it's a violent one. But, you know, he'll go and he'll help a town and, you know, oh, oh, let's make, no, no, you're not going to, there's times in the, in the Galilee where people want to make Jesus king and Jesus is like, nope, 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 not going to do it. I'm going to help yeah. you. And, you know, and then in Christian tradition, then we give the glory to God. Do, do acts of kindness and generosity that are unseen. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the archetype. That's what you do. Yeah. But of course, Jesus yeah, does parallel and what, what we really do, I would say, is just bringing together men. Uh, and, and a lot of the time when you have a group of men together, then uh, the automatic reaction for a lot of them is to, you know, how can I establish my dominance in the room to be the most important person? And so this understanding of just like, well, actually, in alternative ways, how can I be contributing to every single other man in the room without taking the stage myself right. um, and when we're all doing that then you know we if we can make that agreement then that's something that then lifts the entire uh, group and it's often a, a feeling of almost transcendence uh, or like a you know kind of like wow this is fantastic kind of thing when when that culture shift happens anyway so i didn't want to <laughs> interrupt you too much no, no no that's fine and and that's very much jesus too jesus says take the lowest seat and let others lift you up and we all know this you know, you see the guy who's who's trying to make himself, you know, asserting himself, pushing himself forward. Everyone else sits back and and then you look around and you see actually the useful, helpful, generous person who has a backbone, has moral courage, lives out what he believes. And then everyone else in the room says he's the leader. He's the one who has influence. That's power. It's not yeah. the guy who's making all the noise. It's the guy who's actually competent and useful and strong and, and doesn't need to self-promote mm -hmm. because yeah. everyone else promotes him. I mean, who was the most powerful man who ever lived, right? I mean, <laughs> in many ways, it's, it's kind of indisputable. Like Christianity has become the world's biggest religion uh, and probably had a bigger impact on world development, um, you know. Well, the question I often ask people is, who is more powerful, Genghis Khan or Jesus Christ? Because, you know, G people who are studying genetics will say, you know, how many millions of people have genetic material from Genghis Khan? Mm -hmm. you know, just Google that. Mm -hmm. Jesus had no children. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, in a sense, has colonized the world with himself. 
you know, part of the thing that people don't understand is there's an interesting conversation between Tom Holland, who is not a Christian, but he's a, he's a historian of the Roman Empire, and N.T. Wright on the Unbelievable Channel. And, and Tom Holland lately has been studying how Jesus changed the entire concept of morality in the West and eventually the world mm-hmm. by, and you would think, well, a guy has a plan of he's going to be so outrageously generous and he's going to do it in such a way that, and here's the thing to always remember about Jesus. People are like, oh, I wish I knew Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus lived for 30 years in relative obscurity. He made noise for about three years, and the end result was all of the, va- all of the deeply conflicted factions in a very bloody culture war thought the best thing to do with him was to kill him. Mm-hmm. So on one hand, Jesus was enormously attracted, attractive, but also enormously offensive. So offensive that the Romans and the Jews, who were dire enemies of each other, and I mean, it was a very bloody culture war. Eventually, in, you know, there were numerous revolts against Rome. But these two groups who couldn't agree on anything could agree that the world was better without Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's historical. Nobody can deny that. And then this man who so enraged both his fellow countrymen and the imperial overlords that they agreed to kill him, then goes on through his followers to overturn that very same empire within 300 years. Just look at that historical reality and say, that is a man of such immense power. Mm-hmm. But you would say, yeah, but he didn't get to enjoy the power. Ah. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you well, want? You want yeah. to and, and this is also a really interesting mix of kind of like the, the material and what you would call the spiritual world or something like that, right? You spoke about Genghis Khan spreading his influence through his genes, right? And, and then Genghis Khan could, you know, if he, could, if he was alive today, he could feel like, oh, millions of people in the world are my children and oh, that's great. But, but in some ways, um, and I, I think Jesus Christ, you know, the, the passage where he first mentions this idea of uh, communion or the, the, you know, the, the breaking of bread, whatever you want to call it, Eucharist is the word, right, uh, of, of actually ingesting Jesus's flesh and drinking his blood. You know, that's like a, <laughs> a crazy idea. So in some ways it, it brings together, you know, Jesus has had this power to influence the world through his being and his life well after his physical death right. uh, and living on in, in some way um, spiritually or through whatever influence he's had but then at the same time actually you know having millions of people over a billion people all around the world believing that they are ingesting his flesh and blood on every sunday morning or whatever it is they do it and and kind of in that way taking on believing that they are becoming one with jesus uh, through that act right and uh, and i think that's a, a, a incredibly powerful uh, kind of practice to have somehow of combining, you know, because there is a risk. I think many times Christianity becomes this idea of of just like uh, a, a Jesus, and, and in the West we have this tendency to be a little bit up here sometimes, and and so having that physical practice as well of like this is what we're actually doing um, brings those things together in a in a in a beautiful way, right? Uh, and, well, I think, and I think you you set it off nicely. In a sense, the things that you can contrast are the rapes of Genghis Khan and the Eucharist of Christ. Genghis Khan says to every woman that he impregnated, spread your legs and I'm going to use you for my perpetuation. In the Eucharist, Jesus comes and says, I give my life. It's, my, it's your well-being at my expense. Talk about an archetypal contrast. You know, the, the, to, to be a little blunt, the, you know, the raping penis of Genghis Khan versus this is my body, this is my blood given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the contrast. Mm-hmm. And, and it's archetypal because, I mean, there's almost nothing more, there's almost nothing that, that speaks so clearly as a rape and there's nothing that speaks so clearly as 
Jesus saying, you know, in fact, in John 6, Jesus, before he institutes the Lord's Supper, he, he's, he's, people are, he's, he's very, very popular. And he says to this whole group of people who's coming to him looking for him to do miracles and healings and to multiply loaves and fishes, he says, unless you eat my body or drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And everybody just is like, <laughs> what? And, and, and the disciples and, and all kinds of people leave him and reasonably so. And, and so then the, he comes to the disciples and says, you're going to stay here too? Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, where else? But, but he's, yeah, where two, else should we go? Is basically that's right. Say, right? It's like, yeah, we don't know where else to go. We're we lost don't know where else to go. <laughs> and, and so, and you read him sometimes with his disciples. He's tremendously hard on his disciples. Mm-hmm. They and call Peter Satan, right? That's right. Get he behind me, Satan. <laughs> it's like, that's how you speak to your best friend. <laughs> that's right. And right after the, the, the few sentences before he just said, Peter just acknowledged him as Messiah, and Peter said, only God, Jesus says, only God could have showed this to you. A few sentences later, he calls him Satan. Mm-hmm. And then there was, a, there was a situation where he goes and he's invited because, you know, everybody's excited about him, and so people want to leverage their status upon him. So he gets invited to, by these wealthy people to a dinner party, but they really sort of want to undermine him. And so this woman from the village who everybody, the, the suggestion is that she was likely a prostitute. That everybody, that everybody knows is a prostitute. She comes into the house and she starts, you know, anointing his feet and wiping them with her hair. And in that society, for a woman to let her hair down was a rather scandalous activity. And everyone in the house is like, if he were a holy man, he wouldn't let this woman touch him. Mm-hmm. And, and what Jesus says to them is, I came into the house and you didn't, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't extend, extend even basic hospitality to me. And here this woman who you despise because of her morality. See, see, Jesus just keeps undermining all of the stupid human moral tricks we play. And, and so you read Jesus sometimes and say, this is the paragon of morality? Yes. Why? Because he undermines all of the things that we do. And he, he just, he's, he just keeps doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, so what would you say? Uh, yeah. It's uh, how does one explore this in a concrete way then? Um, for, I, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, I, I recommend, um, I recommend, see, the difficulty with the Bible is that it's a difficult book. Mm-hmm. And there are, there, are, there are a lot of, I was just saying in church this past Sunday, one of, one of the real crimes against the church these days is that so often the last place you would go to actually learn anything about the Bible would be a church, because churches are doing so much propaganda and self-promotion that if someone really wanted to come and learn about the Bible, it's tough. But there are, there are good resources. The Bible Project on YouTube, I think, is an excellent resource. Yeah. But I think, I think like, like one, of, one of my new friends via the YouTube thing has been Job in the Netherlands. And Job's just a really smart, curious guy. And so he reads philosophy. The guy reads almost everything. One of the things he started doing with his wife was just, you know, reading the Bible out loud. And then some he'll and just read it honestly. Because you, you begin to see that it's shocking. And there's, the thing is, you'll bump into all kinds of things that you don't understand. And if you actually start to study it, you'll begin to see that, oh my goodness, we've been talking about this book for the last 2,000 years, and it keeps changing the world. That's a strange, strange thing. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I tell people, you know, I have meetups in my church, which mostly men come to. And I just tell people, be honest, be honest about what you think and feel, but, but, but don't be, don't be shallow. If, if, you know, re- respect what, you know, respect what, if, if, a, if for 2000 years, people have been knocking their head against this book, try and figure out why, <laughs> because that yeah. then will drive you into something probably worthwhile looking into. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think for me, after watching Jordan Peterson, then 
reading the Bible, I, I think before my, my approach had always been to look for mistakes, look for problems, look for paradoxes. And so this very critical approach to it, right? And, and, and something that shifted there was just this idea that maybe there's some knowledge and some wisdom in this book that's a little bit greater than my 37 years on this planet. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe I haven't got everything figured out and maybe there's actually something here. And, and so it, it takes a little bit of humility in, in, my, in my perspective. Uh, instead of kind of looking to criticize and looking to find faults, um, but saying like, well, hmm, maybe there's actually something interesting here. And it, it didn't require it by any manner of means. You know, I still have a lot of problems with ideas of, you know, life after death and resurrection and all that kind of stuff, right? I, I simply don't understand those concepts. That they don't completely make sense to me. You know, I've, especially I'm, I'm trained by, you know, a, a Western rational system of thought that is totally, um, you know, kind of very all encompassing in, in many ways and, and so 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 this book was written before that way of thinking is, is happening but 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 just having that kind of openness and that humility uh suddenly a whole lot of things can kind of fit into place somehow um so, you know, and, and i i guess that you need to be a specific place in your life as well right that like yeah. uh, what i see in people as well is the, you, you, there has to be a natural curiosity to like, okay, well, what is this? Or how can I learn something from this? And, and I think, you know, one of the, I think Jordan Peterson's biblical lectures helped a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was just thinking about a number of years ago, I'm looking for it now. You know, Anne Rice is a, uh, a novelist. She wrote the, the Vampire Chronicles. She wrote a, she wrote a, a history of Jesus. I'm looking for it. Oh, she's written a lot of books. Um, and I read that book a number of years ago. And I, I was, I was now a book like that, obviously Christ, um, Christ, the Lord um, was the name of it. Christ, the Lord out of Egypt. Um, now these are, these are, these are novels, but one of the things that I, I appreciated about the novel was it, it gave some cultural background that helped give some understanding. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think you're right. And a lot of people, that's, that's part of what I've appreciated about the Jordan Peterson moment. And part of the reason I think why he's been so much more effective, he's been so very effective as in contrast to a lot of pastors like myself, Mm -hmm. I, I there is he just he just opened up a space for honesty that churches have too often shut, and and so I, I I'm by no means offended if someone comes to the meetup and you know they started reading a gospel and they just say I just can't believe any of this stuff. Well, well maybe we can talk a bit about that because so when I I had this experience of you know I've been an atheist for by far most of my my adult life came across Jordan Peterson and was like, okay, hmm, there's something about this Bible and a new understanding of God. Went and read the Bible and, and was like, wow, there's so much here. This is really exciting and interesting. And then also read about this idea of a church as a, as a spiritual body of a place where I come together with other people and really share you know, my life and, and connect with other people. And this idea of oneness in the church is a really beautiful idea, I think, that we all search for, right? So, so I live in Copenhagen. So then I started visiting lots of different churches. And, and, and you know, what I found is that um, I didn't have a lot of positive experiences a lot of the places where I come. And a lot of churches where I just stayed straight out, like full of rather a lot of women and, and rather effeminate men uh, uh, some of the time. Yeah. Um, hypocrisy seems to be a big thing. It seems to be like, you know, I've had a men's group for five and a half years before this. And this group of men, we rarely could share very openly and honestly and challenge each other and be direct with stuff, right? And I went to these churches and thought, oh, these guys are really, you know, spiritually awake men who are used to talking about things directly. Um, and uh, when I tried talking to, you know, the pastor or other, you know, leaders inside the church in the same way, they like, it was just a big emotional drama, right? <laughs> and they were like, ah, and it was this big thing. So, so yeah, I don't know. What, what is your thoughts about that? I'll come with mine as well afterwards, but I, so when the Jordan Peterson stuff started, I, I had, I, you know, immediately had more people than I had time to be able to process. So as a pastor, what I do is I group people together because 
everything can't flow through the pastor. You have to have people doing it together. And so I started a meetup and the first, I just had Jordan Peterson on meetup.com. I just had Jordan Peterson meetup Sacramento. And the first week I had a dozen people show up, which completely surprised me. And we just come together for what I, I call meaningful conversation. I don't open with prayer. I don't push. If people ask me about my beliefs, I actually do fairly little talking at the meetups because it's, I get a lot of chance to talk on YouTube, but that for many of the men actually, actually last night, a group of us got together with one of the members from the meetup who had suffered a, a pretty significant, um, a pretty significant loss. And he, he called together, you know, some of the people of the meetup. And what I've, what I've noticed is that friendships are developing and community is developing. And then some of the people I did a, I did a conversation on my channel with a group of people from my meetup because what they want to do is help others start meetups. So this past Sunday, we drove up to a place about an hour and a half away from here to help them launch their meetup. And, and so the idea has been, all we, we don't have any secret sauce. We go around the group and do introductions and then conversation begins and men get it. Mostly men have come to the meetup. They're not exclusively men. We always have two or three women in the mix, but it's mostly men. And so then I wonder well, you know, what has happened in our culture. Well, men and women relate Men re relate with men different than women relate with women. Men often relate sort of shoulder to shoulder. And C.S. Lewis, I think, is a really helpful guide in a lot of this because for most of his life, C.S. Lewis was a bachelor. And although it drives women crazy, so C.S. Lewis would say things like, the, the best sound in the world is a bunch of men at the pub, you know, arguing and laughing. <laughs> That's the male voices, C.S. Lewis. And he wasn't gay. He, he married. But, you know, it just... Men, I don't, I don't know why this is. I absolutely but. agree. I mean, for me, it's like for all of human history, men have spent most of their time with men and women have spent most of their time with women up until about C.S. Lewis's time, I guess, right? Like yeah. end of the Second World War, then, uh, then that's when women joined the labor force. And now we even have a political process like a, that's trying to push that men and women should be together even more of the time and you know even yeah. in tech companies and engineering that you know we need to have more women and, and yeah. you know fine with that um but but but, but somehow if there's a group of men together and they're only men then we all have to be concerned or that's immoral if there's a group of women together and they're only women well that's you know and i look at this and i think well, where did we buy these crazy ideas why are we so insecure <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess the whole feminist paradigm has kind of influenced, you know, it's like, oh, the evil patriarchy or something like that. And the history of the world is men oppressing women. Um, and of course, there's been oppression and there's sure. been difficulty. But uh, in the United yeah, States, I, I, we outlawed all the men's schools, but all the women's schools got to buy. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can understand why some of that happened. But at the same time, boys are boys and boys in the West are struggling. And I think that's part of what has made the meetup so important that it isn't a men's thing, but this is, this is where men get to talk together. Have you considered doing it as a men's thing? <laughs> it would definitely trigger some people. But uh, I mean, that's basically, I would say, I don't know if we're talking about the church of Jordan Peterson here, right? But there's some similarities for sure. Uh, between the idea of a spiritual body and speaking truthfully and that, that and, and, and um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I think it's great to have the, the co you know, both genders uh, there, but something else does happen when one woman comes into the room and it, it changes the, yeah. the atmosphere and, and that's not always a negative thing, but sometimes it's a very positive thing to have just those male rooms. And um, I, I saw an article recently about that religions that are dominated by men uh, are very expansive religions and, yeah. and, and they will, and, and men naturally are on a conquest to take over the world, you know, right. especially strong men. That's are, right. <laughs> want to go out and, and you know, go out and do stuff and, and, and where women are much better at kind of holding that wind based. And, yeah. and yeah. that's a, I don't know. I don't even know if you can say it's a shift because I think it's a long time that Christianity has actually, even though we have the very top layer is men, then I think a long time then actually women have 
been taking up a lot of space within the Christian church and, and the values. I read an article about so the, the values of, of, of the church have often been more focused on the, on the feminine side of, yeah. of yeah. things. I, I think the church it naturally has sort of gotten the balance, you know, worked on the balance. And mm -hmm. the, the, we never get these balances right. I mean, it always goes one way or the other. It's just the human nature. But I, I, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to exclude women from the group partly because the women that do come to our group, they, you know, <laughs> they dive right in and you know they don't they don't pull punches and and we all enjoy that. So maybe for lack of a better word, our meetup groups tend to have a lot of masculine energy so that the women come in, they participate too. But it's uh if you're going to bring an argument, bring your argument, <laughs> because yeah. if you know if it's if it's weak, it ain't going to make it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for for us, what what I think we really have seen is is we call it a, a desexualized space, hmm. um, and 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 the moment that you have men and women, especially people who take the time to go to uh, events uh, such as this, then often they're single, right? Or, 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 or you know, because yeah. people who are married and have kids, they're busy and they don't have time to yeah. go and discuss philosophy and stuff like that. And so the moment you have men and women in the room, then, and, and even if they are married, to tell you the truth, that there's this constant kind of uh, dynamic underneath the surface to a certain extent. And, and I don't think we can really avoid that. Uh, men become a little bit more, you know, competitive or wanting to take up space or wanting to fill and, and and when there's no woman around then then there's a, a calmness and, and we could just have another kind of open relaxed discussion and i think woman only groups can do the same thing as well and, and that's something that i have had confirmed with many many people even though it's not the most politically correct thing so so yeah i, I think that there's a, is a power in that there's also a power in having those mixed groups but but there's there's always for me i, I really see how when I, I you know i run men's groups all the time and and there's just a, a complete openness that we can create in a, in a circle um, that yeah. isn't possible uh, with when women are a woman in the room. So. Yeah, that's, that's very true. That's very true. Good. Well, yeah, I think we've been really well around. Um, uh, anything that you want to add before we finish off the, uh, the interview here? Well, I, I hope this has been helpful. You know, if I ramble, I never know if it's helpful or not. So I hope, I hope, someone could, you know, help, hope, hope I've offered something that is, is helpful. And if somebody wants to contact me, my, my email is just my name at Gmail and they're willing to do that. I get a little behind on email sometimes, but um, I, yeah, I have my YouTube channel and I do stuff on that. But no, I, I think the idea of th th this stuff is inexhaustible. We've been, you know, human beings have been working on these questions forever and none of us are about to solve them or resolve them. And, and the same goes for Jesus. You, you, you read them. And again, I think the best thing that someone can do if they're curious about him is just read those gospels in the New Testament and, and find a conversation partner. Maybe if you can find an honest pastor or, or a friend and just, just read it and talk about it with them and say, I read this and what does that mean? And just have the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, kind of uh, just talking with friends sometimes about these things and noticing the reactions because generally, you know, we, what I see, especially here in Europe is people are, you know, really diving into all kinds of Eastern religions and all of that's fantastic and great, but Christianity kind of yeah. somehow sparks a different kind of reaction. So, so which is telling. Yeah. That's it, it's thing. always, it's always this, it's always the stuff that you don't talk about which is probably the stuff you should be talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I think it's been great. So we've really been able to kind of cover many different areas uh, and pick little stories. And I think uh, I've definitely got a better understanding of, of Jesus as, as an archetype that's surprising in many ways, right? And hard to pin down, um, but certainly relevant and, and you know, aspects of it are coming out many different places. And yeah, uh, for anyone watching, I highly recommend taking a look at your YouTube channel, I, I think, uh, and subscribing there. I, I've really enjoyed many of the conversations and, and some of your uh, kind of deep studies, actually, where you really show a broad uh, range of kind of philosophy and different psychological thinkers and bringing it together with 
I'd say it's Jordan Peterson uh, really focused in on on the biblical aspects, um, and and so yeah, kind of uh, yeah, looking more closely at that that side of things. So yeah, highly recommended to check that out as well. Well, thank you for the for the chance to talk. I always I always like talking. Great. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. Okay. Bye bye.